late as it comes around so we could have a better record of your visit. I want to also welcome those who are joining us on television. and Glad to have you worshiping with us this morning. Uh, just a couple announcements before we get started this morning. First of all, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of, uh, of Caroline and I for your, uh, the ways that you have so graciously and wonderfully welcomed us over this past year. And for this morning, uh, for the opportunity, uh, just to celebrate that and to mark that this morning. We uh, have enjoyed this year and are looking forward to many more together. So thank you for that. Um, we've talked a little bit on Wednesday nights uh, and in other times about uh, the youth group that is coming at the end of this month, uh, coming from Trinity Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, it's a church where Jeff Roberts uh, has been the pastor and they're bringing about 75 folks, uh, pretty, pretty large youth group along with adults, and they're going to come and do a week-long mission trip in Middlesbrough uh, for the week of June 21st through the 27th. And one of the things that they've asked for us to help with is the coordination of meals. And it's, I've heard from some Sunday school classes, some individuals, and uh, one of our circles that have said they would be willing to help host a meal uh, we're going to have this down to a science as far as the details and everything. What we need is some people to say, I'll give you uh, an hour of my time and some energy. We'll have all the food purchased. We'll have everything organized as to what needs to go out where and when and all that. We'll need groups every morning to help them set up breakfast and lunch. And we'll need um, some groups uh, five out of the seven evenings to help host supper. And some of those meals have already been taken care of. Uh, some of it will just be serving. Some of it might be just picking up the food. Um, so if you are interested in helping out with that or in other ways, um, they're having 75 folks come from North Carolina. I'd love for 75 of us to be here and to welcome them in different ways and to help them as they uh, are on mission here in Middlesbrough for the week. So if you are interested in being a part of that, uh, and you're not quite sure how to plug in, um, come talk to me, call me, send me an email, um, come by my office. Uh, we can get together, we can talk about that. Talk with your Sunday school groups. Uh, if you ha know a time that works for you all, go ahead and sign up for it. We've got some sign-up sheets that are floating about um, where you can sign up for particular times. Uh, so I look forward to uh, how that's all going to come together, and I want to thank you in advance for your time and energy with that. Uh, you'll notice there's some other uh, activities listed uh, and some other things, some other needs uh, pertaining to our youth group. Uh, be mindful of that, be aware of that, and plug in uh, where, uh, where you can. Let's stand and greet each other as we begin worship this morning. Let's start our worship by singing our hymn of praise, number 227, Praise Him, Praise Him. Please stand as we sing.
Let's pray together. Oh God, as we gather in now, we do come praising you. We come praising you because you are worthy of our praise. You are our creator. You are our redeemer. You are alive and you are working in this world. And we come praising you this morning in worship. Because some of us, it is our custom. For some of us, there is no better place that we could be this morning. This is where we need to be. This is what we need to get through our week. We need to worship you and to be filled by your Holy Spirit. God, as we offer our gifts of praise this morning, as we offer our prayers, as we read scripture, as we fellowship with each other, may we encounter your gracious spirit and may we receive a blessing of enoughness. Enough for today, enough for this week. In your name we pray. Amen. first words of scripture this morning come from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with the 22nd verse of chapter 8. Hear these words from Paul to the church. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. May we trust that interceding spirit as we pray together this morning. Let's pray. God, so often, so often as we come to you in prayer, Whether we are in worship, whether we are sitting on our couch, in our favorite chair, or lying in our bed, or among friends, so often we have a hesitation about us. What do I say? What should I ask? How should I be? What should I think? 
And as distractions come up in our lives, whether in the moment of prayer or if it's the chaos that we go into prayer in the midst of, these distractions deter us, they pull us away, they take our attention and our devotion, which should be focused on you, and they move them elsewhere. And our anxiety that so often can become overwhelming to the point that we just stop praying. There's really no need for that anxiety at all. For we hear these words, we hear this promise that there is a spirit that is interceding on our behalf. One who knows us to the core of our very being. One who is with us as we experience some of the most unspeakable things that we could go through in life. A place where some of our church members are even today. That spirit is with us as we go through the valley of the shadow of grief. That spirit is with us as we celebrate, as we welcome new life. There is not a part of our life that you are closed off from, O oh God. We can't lock the door tight enough. We can't close the windows and bar them enough. You find your way into our lives. And oh, that should give us cause for hope. That though we may see through a glass darkly, we do see. And if we can look long enough, we will see that there is only love. Your love which constantly surrounds us, which holds us up, which carries us in the moments where we are too exhausted to go on. Your love celebrates with us in our deepest joys and excitements. Your love is with us always. God, join us together in that love that we find embodied in the presence of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing hymn number 406, The Solid Rock.
pause a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today praising you as the great provider. You provided us the rain last night and the glorious sunshine of today. How fitting it is for us to give back a little of what you give us. Bless these gifts for the glory of your kingdom. These things are pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
remember that day on the mountain As I lived in this valley below And through all my days of darkness There's one thing that I know Somebody asked me earlier if I had gotten a new robe and a hat, and I just got a new stole. It may just be that this red looks so good with this black. <laughs> <laughs> We're catching on here. We're catching. Um, we're, today is the, uh, marks the day of Pentecost. That's what we're going to read about in Scripture, and that's the reason for the red, which is a reminder of the flames, the flames of fire. Um, it was a powerful time, and red is such a powerful color. Uh, it's striking to the eye, and I imagine what the disciples and those gathered experienced was striking for them in their own walks of faith. Hear these words. Uh, from the second chapter of Acts, and I'm only going to read the first 13 verses, not all the way through verse 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our native languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. How many of you have ever had to or have ever tried to communicate in another language? Anybody? That's a pretty good group. Maybe it was as simple as ordering off a menu. Numero uno, right? saying please or thank you. Maybe it was you were trying to find where the nearest bathroom was. Maybe it was just saying 
hello, hola. You could tell I had a little bit of Spanish. Maybe you didn't know the language at all. Maybe what you had to resort to was the universal language of charades. Anybody ever done that? Yeah? Have you ever tried to communicate with someone who spoke a different language than you? My, my first experience that I can remember with someone who spoke a different language than me was going to the Hispanic migrant worker camps that were around our area during the springs and summers with my mother and some of the other ladies in the church who were leading backyard Bible clubs. I was probably five years old at the time. We went with the local Baptist Association missionary, who, as far as I can remember, didn't speak any Spanish. In fact, I don't even know if he had a love for the Spanish language and culture or not. I do remember that he loved quail hunting. And every time he would fill in at the pulpit at, at First Baptist Cordial, he would always work into his sermon somehow uh, the lessons of faith that can be learned from quail hunting. There's, there's a lot there. Uh, Reverend Troy Sheffield was his name. I never heard Brother Troy, as we called him, I never heard Brother Troy speaking Spanish. I know my mom didn't and doesn't speak any Spanish. What I do remember, though, because of some pictures, there was a girl. Her name was Linda Hernandez, and she was about eight years old. Um, we have some old pushpin punched photographs of this beautiful little girl with her long, dark hair standing in the middle of this group of children and adults translating the Bible stories from English into Spanish. She had gone far enough in school that she knew enough English, and of course she knew her Spanish, and so she was translating for the whole group of ours. And my memory resides in pictures as far as that goes. But my mom said, yeah, yeah, she was our translator. Imagine relying on an eight-year-old to translate your Bible stories. There's probably a good lesson of faith there. My only other memory of that occasion was Andy and I out playing with some of the Hispanic children who were our age. And I know that we didn't speak any Spanish at the time, but we knew enough of what we needed to know to communicate. And maybe those early experiences were the reason when, when it came to my turn to choose a language to study in high school, I chose Spanish. And I loved it, still do, though I don't remember a lot of my vocabulary like I should. My Spanish teacher would say that was muy mal, very bad. Um, but I've always been fascinated with other languages and cultures. Isn't it amazing, isn't it amazing in this day and time how much more connected we are with the rest of the world and what's going on? How many of you, of you remember 30 or 40 years ago looking at the paper and the percentage of news that was there in the paper that was just about where you lived. It was probably pretty high, wasn't it? But think about now. Think about the news that we get every day. There's not a news story or a country that exists that's off limits to our perusing, to our studying about, to our reading, to our hearing a dialect. It wouldn't take much for us to figure out what's going on in Eastern Africa or in South America, or in Southeast Asia, no matter where we wanted to connect with, we could do that in this day and time. We live in an interconnected society. Um, if, if we probably looked at the labels on our clothing, we would be amazed at the number of different countries that we are connected to just with where we get our clothing from, right? Right? It's pretty amazing all the different ways that we, if you go through a grocery store, go through the produce section, you'll find that the produce that we eat week in and week out is from all over this country, some of it from all over the world. 
We are interconnected. I had this uh, friend in Athens. His name was Doug. Doug worked for the McDonald's Corporation. Doug was the guy, whenever McDonald's was going to move into a new market, into a new country, they sent Doug in. Doug was the one that went and talked to every. I didn't know that that kind of person existed, but I guess it makes sense, you know, when you think about it. I had to have somebody that went and spoke to whoever it was in the government, the president, the king, whoever it was that said, okay, you can talk to the parliament or whoever. And he did all that greasing of the wheels before McDonald's moved into a new market. He has been all over the world. He's also a fishing nut. And in the course of his work all over the world, everywhere he went, he always managed to work in a fishing trip. And he told me when we were in Athens and we were talking about some of his different experiences, he said, you know, I've, I've fished on every continent in the world. And I said, no, you, who's fished in Antarctica? He said, oh, well, yeah, okay, I hadn't fished Antarctica, but, but I, had a, I had a chance to. And my wife was tired of me being gone for three months, and so she made me come on back, and I had to miss the trip. But, but who of us would have ever imagined being able to do exactly what it is that you love anywhere in the world you wanted to do it? It's a picture of our interconnectedness. I've had an opportunity to preach in some different places The first time I preached in a different culture and context, it didn't go so well. In fact, it was it was pretty bad. And and I realize now looking backwards why. The reason why is I was afraid. I was nervous about what I was doing. I was afraid to say the wrong thing. It was only the third or fourth time that I had ever preached, including standing up in preaching class, and I was still trying to figure out if preaching was something that I wanted to do, that I could do, that I was called to do. And so out of fear, I brought a sermon that I had preached in a preaching class, just in case, just in case I felt like I was going to need it. Um, You know, thinking as if that, that that sermon that was for a completely different context for a completely different group of people, a group of students in a seminary, was going to fly somewhere else. But when fear takes over, we have a way of doing what it is that we want to do rather than what we should do. And I should have trusted, but I didn't. We were in Bulgaria, in southeastern Europe, and we were up in the northern part of the country in some rugged mountains. And it was the middle of, at that point in time, the hottest summer on record. This was the first village that we worked in. I don't even remember the name of the village. It was so small. And I was, by some luck of the draw, the first one out of our group who was going to preach. Everybody had to do it, but I was the first one. We were meeting with a very small but very dedicated Bulgarian Baptist church. They didn't have a pastor, except when one of the area pastors um, from about, well, I say area, from about 150 kilometers away managed to make it up by the church, and then everybody would gather and they would have services. There were less than 20 members in this little village church, and the village probably numbered around 1,000 people. No one in the church spoke any English, only Bulgarian. And none of the Bulgarians that were gathered there had anything more than a grade school education. One of the church members that I do remember was, he was an older gentleman. He had fought in World War II. And he rode a bicycle three miles one way to come to church when he could. And that day he had ridden his bicycle in the middle of, I think, 103, 104 degree heat. And on his way to come to church, he'd stopped at a cherry tree, and he climbed the cherry tree and picked a bag of fresh cherries for the visitors to his church. Now, just picture that, right? This gentleman was in his early 70s, 
and he's climbing up in a cherry tree. I think some of our members could probably do that. Riding his bicycle, bag of cherries, he comes in. He was late because he had spent his time picking cherries. And so when he finally rode up and leaned his bike against the wall, we had already started the service. He came and he sat down on a pew, which was a rough-hewn log that was balanced on a stack of concrete blocks in the middle of a dirt floor. And after two songs, our guide and translator, Chris Angelov, motioned for me to come up to preach. And this was one of those times where I was wishing we could have sung five or six more songs because I just wasn't quite ready. I got up there as nervous as I have ever been, and I tried to preach. I really tried to give that sermon flight, to send it out there to get it going, and it took off like a lead balloon and fell at my feet. I had some good stories in it, I remember that. I had exegeted the text well, I had really done my work with the commentaries, and I had put the two together. It was just, it was a really good sermon on paper. I just hadn't thought at all about my audience. Hadn't done it for some reason, just hadn't done it. It wasn't till I was finishing up my sermon and offering an invitation that I really began to see what was around me. The room that we were sitting in had one light bulb dangling from a wire in the middle of the room. It wasn't on because there wasn't any electricity to the village at that time of the day. The room wasn't even halfway finished. It was just concrete block walls. And as I stood in the front of the church looking towards the back, the entire right side of the church was wide open. There was only three walls. They hadn't been able to afford to finish building the church was missing an entire wall and we couldn't see that from the road when we parked we couldn't see that from where we were on the road but from inside the church we could see the rest of the village all around us we could see the mountain range towering in the background surrounding this village we could see the ramshackle dwellings all the way through this little village and maybe that was the sermon right there maybe that was was the sermon you know I got to thinking about it maybe that's the problem with some of our churches today maybe the problem with some of our churches today is that there are too many walls in our buildings maybe some of what needs to happen to our churches today is that a wall needs to be torn down so that the people in our churches can look out and can see the world around them, can see where they are, can see where they live. Maybe we see some of our world, but maybe there's parts of it that we're not turning and facing and we need to be able to look out and see it. And on the other hand, maybe some walls need to be torn down so some of the folks outside the church can look in and can see that those of us who are gathered inside aren't too different, humanly speaking, from those on the outside. We're just regular people too. We have our struggles just like everybody else. Maybe some walls need to be torn down. I was talking with Chris, our translator and guide, about what I had experienced in those moments uh, a day or two afterwards when I'd given myself some time to think. And I told him about how frustrated I was with myself. And he said, as a, as a preacher himself, it was sometimes really difficult to translate for a really bad sermon <laughs> or for... For someone, for a preacher who is preaching something counter to the gospel that he knows. And I asked Chris if he ever offers a little unsolicited help, since he is the one doing the translating. And if the person preaching needs a translator, they probably don't know what he's saying. Does he ever 
add a little bit here and there. And he laughed. He said, yeah, sometimes. And I said, did you do that for me the other day? And he graciously said, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> Let me read part of this scripture again. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. All together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each one of us in our native language? You see, this is an important moment in the life of the, other, of the early church. This is another step forward towards that great commission calling that Jesus gave to the disciples. Go and preach the gospel where? Just where you live, right? Just to the countryside? No, ultimately to the ends of the earth. And what we hear, what we hear in the scripture about those gathered here is they represent these ends of the earth. They've all gathered into this place. Pentecost literally means 50th day. And it was a day-long harvest festival that was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. So the Passover that Jesus and his disciples uh, celebrated just before Jesus was uh, arrested and tried and crucified, 50 days later is where we are. And they're celebrating this feast of Pentecost. That is, it was on the Jewish calendar long before this moment. Right? And this is a normal gathering worship time. It'd be like us gathering for Advent. Advent's been on the calendar, right? That build up to the birth of Christ. They were going to gather for Pentecost anyway. But here they are, in light of everything that's happening, doing what it is that they are called to do, following their Jewish traditions and culture. And they're gathered in Jerusalem. It was one of three pilgrimage feasts Pentecost was when the entire household of Israel from all over the nations came to Jerusalem they made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and gathered together to celebrate the goodness of God so we've got all these nations that have come together to celebrate the goodness of God towards Israel and if we were remembering this command of Jesus to go and make disciples go to the ends of the earth, suddenly what the disciples are finding is that the ends of the earth have come to them, right? That they're right there at their doorstep. They don't have to go out far beyond, even though some of them do. They've come right to their doorstep. The world has come to Jerusalem and this is another image of the universality of the message of God. And notice in Scripture, it doesn't say that just a few were gathered. Notice it doesn't say that only the important ones were gathered. It doesn't say only the saved were gathered or only the elect were gathered. It says all were gathered in one place. Luke's wanting us to hear something here. Luke, the writer of Acts, is wanting us to hear something here. And by the way, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came with a sound like that of a rushing wind, and there were tongues of fire. There was a real, tangible presence of the Spirit among those gathered that day. That's what we need to understand. There was a real, tangible presence. You could hear it. 
you could see it, you could feel it, you could experience it. And those that were gathered were given the gift of speaking in foreign languages. Uh, Luke uses a different word here than the word glossolalia, which is the word that Paul uses for speaking in tongues, which is only given to a few believers. This is given to everybody. And those who were gathered, those who were listed, all of those nations that I'm just going to read through that list one time, if that's okay. Um, All of those that are listed there, I think what Luke is trying to say is there's an inclusive nature to the boundaries of the gospel. In other words, there are no boundaries. It includes everybody. Because a couple of the the names that are listed um, are people groups that didn't even exist They had already kind of gone away by the time Luke is writing this, by the time of this experience. So he's including people past. He's including people present. And I think we are to assume that we are included in that gathering as well. And the Jews who were present, one of the things that I think is interesting is that the Jews who were present there recognize the familiar Galilean dialect. As they're talking, it's like somebody from the south trying to speak Spanish with a southern accent, right? You can hear from the dialect, you're not a native Spanish speaker, are you? And they're hearing, okay, you're not a native Cretan, are you? You're not a native, I can hear by your dialect, by the way that you're talking, that you're Galilean. And I think that's important for us to hear especially as a church, because I think what we need to understand is the language of the Spirit isn't communicated with perfect or heavenly diction. It is not free from the marks of humanity. It's our language, right? We are to use our language in communicating the love and grace of Jesus Christ. There's no special formula There's no certain language that we're supposed to... It's supposed to sound like our tongue, right? The way that we speak now, that's what God wants us to use. God doesn't want us to have somebody else's language. God doesn't want us to have some certain forms of speech that we use, but who we are, where we are now, that's who God wants wants to use, the language of particular human groups spoken in their idiom. God wants us to talk like we talk when we share the gospel. Because God works in collaboration with real people. And if if we were trying to be somebody else, we're not ourselves, we're not being real. Now what does this look like? What does this look like at home, had a moment the other day with my little niece and nephew. Actually, I was told about it uh, by my mother-in-law. Uh, Jack and, and uh, Mary Patrick were staying over with Caroline's mom at the house. And uh, Jack's at that age where it doesn't take much to kind of set him off and for him to kind of get upset. Um, he, he likes to be close to his mommy. Um, which is not a bad thing. He just just was having a bad day that day. And his mom and dad had to go and, and uh, do something for, uh, for Tom's work, and so they were gone a little bit later than they thought they were going to be. And a thunderstorm came up, and that was really all Jack needed to kind of go over the edge. And little Mary Patrick, who's three years old, um, came to him as he was laying on the floor in the middle of the living room having a tantrum, She came to him and she leaned down and she got right next to his head and she started rubbing the top of his head and she said, It's okay, honey. Mom and Daddy be right back. (laughs) Honey, it's okay. And about the time she was doing that, Anne walked into the room and she saw this happening. And Mary Patrick noticed that she had come in and she kind of looked up at her as if to say, is, is this right? Is this what I'm supposed to do, right? They, they're coming back. 
And Ann just winked and nodded, and she kept going, It's okay, honey. Mom and Daddy, be right back. Nobody had ever told her that it's almost absurd for a three-year-old to offer that kind of perspective and comfort to her five-year-old brother. Nobody had ever told her, you know, that just seems kind of strange. That seems almost crazy. Like, you shouldn't be doing that. An adult should be doing that. Nobody ever put those boundaries on her. So she was free to respond to the situation that she saw at hand, her brother who was hurting, and she offered comfort. And I wonder what has happened in the lives of us as individuals, in the lives of our churches, where we have bought into the lie, where we can say, no, I shouldn't be doing that. Sunday school teacher, no, I shouldn't be doing that. Helping out with the youth, no, I shouldn't be doing that. Working with the children, no, I shouldn't be doing that. Putting my name on the list to be a deacon, no, I shouldn't be doing that. I've heard people that can go down and they can give you a reason at every single place in the church life of why they shouldn't be doing something, why they shouldn't be doing this, why they shouldn't be doing that. Where do we get that from? Because... The way I understand it, God has gifted all of us for service. Some of us in different ways than maybe we have ever been willing to serve. When are we going to be willing to listen to the Spirit that for some of us has been speaking for years saying, I want you to get involved in this way. When are we going to hear God's call in our lives without putting our own parameters on what it is that we are willing to do. There is a risk. There is an adventure to being church. And it should be one that we are excited about being a part of. Sir Francis Drake, in 1577, wrote these words. Disturb us, Lord. Disturb us when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, We have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery. We're losing sight of land. We shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us into the future with strength, with courage, with hope, and with love. You see, there was a disturbance that day in Jerusalem. Those who were gathered had never seen things happen that way before. And with the participants, those who had received the Holy Spirit, those who were then called to risk themselves and to enter the arena and become a part of God's transforming presence in the world, I guarantee you there was a disturbance. When we were gathered that day in that church in northwest Bulgaria, if my sermon had been the only sermon preached that day, I might not be standing in this pulpit today. Thank goodness there was another sermon preached that day in Bulgaria. And no words were being exchanged as it was preached. The sermon belonged to the old gentleman, the old gentleman who rode in on the bicycle And as he broke open his bag of cherries, we gave thanks with our smiles and we took and we ate. 
And it tasted, it tasted a little bit like bread and wine. And that is how, whether we are the ones who are disturbed or whether we are a part of the disturbance, as Christ transforming grace is a part of all of that, that is how new and wonderful and beautiful things happen in our lives and in our churches and in our communities as we are willing to risk and to give ourselves over to the grace of Christ. May it be so for all of us this day and always. Amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 198, At the Name of Jesus. If there is any decision that you would make as we stand and sing together, will you come? Let's stand together. So good to see you all here this morning. I wish Caroline could have been here for the surprise this morning because it truly was uh, a surprise. Thank you again. Let's receive the benediction. Brothers and sisters, as you go forth from this place, know that God goes with you. May God push back the boundaries of your horizons so that you can once again dream big dreams and have new spaces opened up in your lives. Go and risk yourselves for the kingdom of God. Amen.